is the, uh, the last uh, talk of the quarter, fall quarter, and um, we will be resuming in winter quarter. The first talk of winter quarter will be on January 4th. It will be Adriana Galvan of the UC LA Psych Department. Um, I don't have her title yet, but she studies um, brain uh, changes in the development of risk-taking in adolescents. So that will be the first talk of the quarter. And I apologize for not posting the um, talks yet, but we still have a couple um, titles and things that we don't have in, but we'll be posting the, the winter quarter schedule very soon. So look we'll at the website for that at beck.ucla.edu. And without further ado, let me introduce today's speaker, um, Kathy Reed from the Department of Psychology at Claremont McKenna College. will be talking to us about the role of specialized body processing for body and social perception. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to talk here today. And part of what I'm presenting today has a little bit of uh, a little bit of an experiment on my part. I'm trying trying out some new ideas on you, and we'll see if they work or not. So thank you for bearing with me for things that may seem not all the way thought through or a little roughed out. But I'm really interested in, in in your thoughts and criticisms on this. First of all, I just want to point out that this is a picture by Georg Baselitz, and Georg Baselitz made his career as an artist by drawing pictures of human and, and other kinds of animals and then presenting them upside down. And some of his writings on why he presented humans upside down was he said, when we see other people, we just like take it for granted. We just do automatically look at them and move on. But when you turn a person upside down or you see an upside down person, it, it disrupts things and you have to stop and look and look again. And this is sort of the real basis of sort of the whole thing that I'm going to be talking about today. So one of the most important things that we need to do as humans is to recognize other people as conspecifics and sort of understand what they're feeling, thinking, and what they intend to do. Now one question we might ask ourselves is, how do we perceive and understand someone else's emotions? And one of the ways that we know this is we can see it by facial expressions, as you see in this picture here. We can know if someone is happy by looking at their face, but we can also know that they're happy by looking at what they're doing with their body. Because typically, what you're doing with your body is mimicked, or what you're doing with your face is mimicked by what you were doing with your body. So as you can see, her body postures have to, you know, give you some indication that she's happy as well as her face. But the other thing I want to point out is you don't have to see someone's face to know what they're feeling, as you can see from this picture right here. And what I would like to argue is that um, other people are very special, are, are a special class of objects, because we not only see their faces and bodies, but we also have faces and bodies. And the idea here is that we can use our own emotional experiences, facial and body actions to help interpret the actions of others, because we have this self-other correspondence. So recently, uh, Paula Niedenthal, Piotr Winkleman, Larry Barcelow, and others have proposed um, embodied emotion theory. And what they've argued is that perceiving and thinking about emotions involves somatovisceral and motor re-experiencing, or the embodiment, of the relevant emotion in one's own self. And the idea is that you see somebody else feeling something, and you sort of simulate it in your own body to be able to figure out how you are categorizing what you think someone else is feeling. And what I'm going to say here is they talk about all emotional experience and their embodied emotion theory, but we're going to talk about what they, or we're going to focus on what they consider online emotional processing. And this is when emotional stimuli are present in the world and when other people are providing the emotional stimuli. We're not really talking about memory for emotions or recalling of past experience kind of things. We're really talking about in the present processing of emotions. So here's the working proposal. I believe, and my colleagues believe, that the embodied emotion theorists have a missing mechanism. What they're doing is they're just assuming that um, this emotional si simulation process just sets up and goes. But our question is, how does this simulation process get set up? And we believe that they're missing some very basic body processing mechanisms from which these simulations of emotional experience operate. So the idea here is that when we're in social interactions, we have to uh, recognize conspecifics and quickly determine if other people are like me. In other words, do you match up with someone else? And our argument is that if you can't do this basic body 
process it and create these correspondences between yourself and someone else, then you can't engage in the emotion simulation process. And this has implications for people who have social processing deficits. So in today's talk, what I'd like to do is provide some motivation about why we think social emotion perception requires specialized body processing. We're going to present some research that suggests that we actually do use our bodies and that our body perception of other people is different from the processing of other kinds of objects. And then we're going to show some research that connects this body processing with emotional processing and then show you that you can find that we have a breakdown in specialized body processing. Um, let me rephrase this. The people who have social processing deficits can also be shown to have a breakdown in these specialized body processing mechanisms. Okay. So let's try to motivate this, this whole idea that um, embodied cognition begins with body processing. So the basic uh, theories of embodied cognition is that, that we, are involved, we evolve to act in the world. From the moment that we wake up and get our first cup of coffee till at night when we turn out the light, our movements and our actions perform functional things that help us get along in the world. But there are other things in the world that are separate from our own bodies. There are also the perceptions of other people's bodies. And because humans are social animals, it's very important for us to understand what other people are doing. So we have to understand their movements and actions as well. We need to know what they're currently doing. We need to know. Um, the meaning of what they're doing and what they're going to do next, and perhaps most importantly, how we're going to respond to that action. The other uh, aspect of embodied cognition theories is that actions take place in a context. And, and in particular, that your actions are constrained by the environmental features and our own goals. So for example, we perceive a chair very differently if we're going to go and put books on a chair and use it as a surface for something else, or if we're going to use the chair as something to sit on. Now think about what happens when we think about other people in our environment. Now these objects, not like chairs, now have intentionalities, and they're thinking of their own things to do, and they're doing their own actions. And you can imagine how this is going to increase the, the processing complexity of trying to figure out how you should act if something else also has intentionality and is acting at the same time. So the idea is it's a lot simpler to think about how you would perform uh, actions on a chair um, that you're going to sit on as opposed to a chair at the department. <laughs> so anyway, the idea is the social context increases our processing loads and constraints that are relevant to our own actions. So, so this whole idea of, of social context I just want to sort of motivate why it's really important or, or sort of how this is really a fundamental feature of our uh, social processing system as humans. Because in order to, to really work well in our social environment, we have to be able to interact with others. And we do this a lot of times by using body postures. And animals at all levels of the phylogeny use body posture to signal social status and to communicate. And so, you know, apes in the jungle may show, you know, show dominance by beating their chest. <laughs> um, but the fact is, we, it's not that we will go beat our chest in a board meeting, but we do other kinds of posturing that allows us to sort of establish social dominance. And so, when we are looking at other people, um, and when we're looking at other conspecifics, we need to figure out whether they're like me. We have to create a correspondence between what we're doing and what someone else is doing, which has this increased processing load compared to inanimate objects. And what I'd like to argue is that we have body-specific representations and processes that organize social information for us to try to provide processing efficiencies to decrease our processing load. And so the idea is that these body-specific representations and processes not only facilitate our actions in the world, but they also help social understanding. So what I'd like to do now is give you some research to show that uh, we use our own bodies, or, or how our own bodies can uh, influence our perception of other people, and to demonstrate that we have some visual processing mechanisms that, may, that are different for the perception of other people compared to inanimate objects. So one of the first questions we could ask is whether or not we use our own body representation to interpret the actions of others. And Martha Fair and I 
slide, uh, <coughs> did, the, did the first uh, set of studies in which what we did was we gave people a dual task experiment. We had them see a picture of a, of a body in a particular position. It would go blank, and then you would see a body rotated 90 degrees, and you had to say whether it was the same or different. Now, what's sort of funny about this is that this, this is a very st uh, simple posture, but the postures that we were looking at were ones were non-canonical kinds of postures that didn't have any particular <coughs> label. They were abstract body postures, and they were more complex than just standing there. And the reason why we had people turn was we wanted them to create a body representation so they weren't just using a residual visual image to make the comparison between body postures. Now, before they did this task, we did one other thing. We cued them to either focus on the arms or the legs, and we told them that, that, would, be, that would be, if there was going to be a change, it would occur in that part of the body. And so this way we could keep track of sort of what part of the body they were attending to. Now, to show that, uh, so, so this is sort of how we remember other people's postures. Now we had to add a second task that had to do with keeping track of your own body postures to see whether this would interact with your visual perception of someone else. So what we had people do was create non-repetitive arm movements or leg movements. And so they, people couldn't just go like this, or they couldn't just go like this. They had to keep moving their postures to different positions and keep track of their own uh, posture. So the idea is that if what you're moving is affecting what you're seeing, you should find a, a relationship between what you're moving and what you're focused on and someone else. And this is what we find. We find an interaction between the body part that you're moving and the body part that you're focused on. What we find is that when you are moving your arms and you're focused on the arm part, you have relatively fewer errors compared to when you're uh, moving your arms and you have to remember the legs. And you basically find the opposite effect for leg, leg movement and uh, leg position memory. Now you might say, well, this is all fine and good. It's clear that sort of what you're doing is affecting your perception of another object. But how do we know that it's body parts? How do we know it's body specific? Why is it not just any part, upper part of the body? When you're moving the upper part of you, you're focused on the upper part of something else. Well, we did the same experiment, but we did it with Lego blocks, where the Lego blocks were abstract figures where they had two different colors. They had a yellow top and a white bottom. But what happened was, we didn't find this inter body we didn't find this interaction for objects. <coughs> um, it seems like this interaction is specific to bodies and body postures. So what you're doing um, is affecting your perception of other people. And we would argue that we're sort of using the same body representation to encode our own bo body posture as well as somebody else's. So now the question is, well, there seems to be something about sort of our perception of bodies that's different from other objects. Can we find that there are specific kinds of processing mechanisms that are also specific for human bodies, or at least for bodies that seem to be like us? So to address this question, we sort of thought about what kinds of uh, work has been done in the object recognition literature. And our question was, um, how could we fit bodies into what we currently know about object recognition and processes. One of the things that we know is that faces seem to be processed differently from other kinds of objects. We know, you know, all faces sort of share two eyes, a nose, and a mouth, and the eyes are above the nose, above the mouth, and they have a very specific configuration. And what we found is that through a variety of different kinds of um, paradigms, the faces seem to be processed in a sort of a configural manner. In other words, it's all the parts together that give you the ability to recognize an individual face. Now, this is different from recognizing other kinds of objects, such as houses or shoes or things like that. Those recognition of other kinds of objects tends to be part face. People tend to recognize a particular feature of the object. And um, as a result, uh, it doesn't really matter what orientation you see an object. You know, for the most part, you can kind of recognize these parts from any orientation or sort of from any kind of angle. So the question we asked was whether or not our object recognition processes for bodies were more like houses or more like faces. So to get at this question, we co-opted a paradigm from the face recognition li literature called the face inversion paradigm. And the idea is that face inversion, the face inversion effect, this is that upright faces are 
faster and easier to recognize than upside down faces. People have used this as an empirical indicator of configural processing. And the idea is that when you invert a face, you've disrupted the spatial relations among the features, because no longer are the eyes above the nose, above the mouth. In fact, they're exactly the opposite. And now a face inversion effect, in terms of data, would look something like this. So this could be uh, D prime measures, accuracy measures, but the idea is that upright faces um, are, you have greater visual sensitivity, higher accuracy for recognizing upright faces than inverted faces. So the question is whether or not the same thing is true for bodies. So to do this, we use a classic inversion effect paradigm where people were shown uh, a body posture briefly, it went blank, and then they had to say whether this posture was the same as that posture. You want to try one? Okay, so the idea here is this is actually faster on the computer screen than what you see here, but we're running into limits of PowerPoint. So what I want you to do is you'll see a body, it'll go blank, it'll come up, and I want you to say out loud, same or different. Okay? Ready? Come on! <laughs> okay, different. Yes, there were changes in the head and foot position. Okay. So that wasn't, obviously, you guys are either really shy or it wasn't that easy. <laughs> okay, let's try an upright body trial. Are you ready for this one? Here we go. Okay. You're right. There were changes in the head. Now, did you know that this was the same posture that you just saw before? Okay, so just from your gut feeling, you can tell that upside down bodies are really processed quite differently from upright bodies. So if, you know, just, just from a really simple example like this, you can see that there's some inherent truth to it. All right, so the first thing we did to figure out whether configural processing, or whether configural bodies were processed using configural processing, or whether they were processed more like houses using part bay processing, we compared bodies and houses. And what we found was you get inversion effects for bodies, where upright is more accurate than inverted stimuli for bodies, but we don't get the same effect for houses. So this suggests that maybe bodies are processed configurally, but we can't really say anything until we compare them with faces. So this is what we um, did next. We compared body postures with faces. And what we found was that both faces and bodies showed inversion effects, and they were actually of comparable magnitudes. So this suggests that maybe both faces and bodies are processed configurally, at least to some extent. It doesn't necessarily say they're using exactly the same mechanisms, but it says that there's something about the configuration of the bodies that seems to be, um, or in the configuration of the faces, that seems to use a similar processing mechanism. So now that we have this inversion effect, we can actually now use this inversion effect to tell us how our visual systems recognize that other things are human bodies or not. So the idea is that if the visual system thinks it's a human body, you should find inversion effects, and if it thinks it's not a body, you should lose them, right? So what we did was we wanted to see sort of how much of a body is needed to create this configural processing effect. So to do this, we compared various parts of bodies. So we had a whole body just to set our control condition to demonstrate that we're getting the inversion effect of the whole body. But then we looked at half bodies, where um, bodies were divided along their vertical axis. And the idea is that if, you know, once, since, since bodies are symmetrical, it's possible that you can recreate the other side of your body with only half of the body. But um, we also looked at it in terms of whether or not we, so uh, if we divide bodies along the horizontal axis, so we have upper versus lower portions of the body. And what you might say is that really our inversion effect is coming from the configuration of the upper body, because we have so many degrees of freedom for our bodies that we don't really have with our legs, because they're really providing postural support. So it's possible that we might find inversion effects <coughs> for the bodies, but not the legs, or, or it may just be that you can kind of construct a body if you're given half the lower half of the upper half. We looked at body parts to see whether or not just the local configuration of the limb could provide inversion effects. Because it could be that you know, sort of whether or not your hand is this way or this way really changes the local configuration of the body. And then we also looked at scrambled bodies where we basically put a body limb so that no body limb was in the, the correct part. And a lot of our people said that that looked painful. <laughs> Okay, so what do we find? So these are D prime measures, or visual sensitivity measures. And what you see is for whole bodies, 
we get a very strong inversion effect. When we divide it in half along the symmetrical uh, vertical axis, we again find significant body effects. But for the half bodies, we lose them. And it's also it's true for upper halves as well as lower halves. So it's not just the upper half of the body that's providing the salient information here. I'm sorry, I'm going to go away. The other thing is we find that there's no inversion effect for body parts. We have very good discriminability, but no inversion effect. And then this is really interesting. For the scrambled body parts, what we find is not only um, do you not get an inversion effect, but your visual discrimination just drops precipitously. You know, and basically it's when you've completely screwed up <coughs> the body representation, you, you're sort of at the point where you can no longer really process it at all. So this, these series of studies tell us that we seem to have a distinctive body posture recognition process. And it appears to be something that's more similar to faces than houses in terms of configural processing. The, the last study suggested that our body is really defined by its hierarchical structure and its biomechanical properties. And it suggests that this sort of our body, inherent body representation seem to be interacting with these configural processing mechanisms to give us this sort of specialized body processing. Now the question is, can, we, we have studies that show that what we're doing affects our perception of someone else. We have studies that show that we seem to have these specialized body processing mechanisms. Now the question is, can we show that these specialized body processing mechanisms can um, sort of be mapped onto other things that are further away or closer to us? In other words, can we use our expertise for our own bodies to process other things? So to look at this question, um, we sort of employed something called a body specificity hypothesis. And the idea is that we have specialized processing for bodies that are a lot like ours. So our embodiment expertise hypothesis suggests that we use our motor, our proprioceptive, and kinesthetic experiences that are associated with living in a body and knowing how to use it to interpret other things in the visual world that, that we can map onto that, as opposed to just pure visual experience. Um, people like Isabel Gautier and other people of the Perceptual Expertise Network have suggested that really um, configural processing, these special mechanisms, are really all about just visual expertise. We see more of them, and so we sort of created this general processing mechanisms for things that we're expert on. So to sort of try to see which one of these things might be operating for different kinds of body postures, we compared um, two different kinds of animate Im Im images. So the idea, we looked at dogs versus humans. And the idea was that dogs have um, very different biomechanics, and they do very different kinds of things. And so the question is, would you get body inversion effects for dogs as opposed to people? So to create these images, what we did was we had people make a whole list of common human postures and a whole list of common dog postures. And then we created these poser stimuli in these postures. And then we had them rank them in terms of frequency and how, you know, how light, you know, how um, stereotypical are these postures of a particular class. And what we found is that the humans and the human postures were ranked the highest, and dogs and dog <laughs> postures were ranked the highest, uh, were ranked the lowest. I'm sorry, let me get this straight. For dogs and dog postures, they were rated as most typical. Humans and human postures were rated most typical. And humans and dog postures were rated least typical, and dogs and human postures were really boosted. So we created a whole set of stimuli with these. And these different kinds of stimuli give us different kinds of predictions. So if sort of visual expertise were sort of driving all of our specialized processing effects, we would expect <coughs> to see um, a greater inversion effect for humans over dogs. And the idea is that we see humans more than dogs. Even people in Colorado see more people than dogs, even though the golden retriever is like the most frequently thing, thing seen other than humans. And the other thing is, if you separate you know, the common stimuli by the rare stimuli, if it were purely visual expertise, we would find for both dogs and humans, we would get an inversion effect for common but not rare categorized stimuli. On the other hand, the embodiment expertise gives you slightly different predictions. Now, you get the same predicted difference for overall inversion effects for humans 
over dogs, but it's for a different reason. Instead of just purely visual frequency, you basically have experience using your human body more than you have over the dog body. And so you would get the inversion effect overall for humans. But the effects of frequency is, is the sort of more interesting interaction. The idea here is we would, for common um, and rare human poses, we expect that we would get inversion effects for all kinds of human poses because we can use our expertise and our knowledge of our own bodies on how to get into all different kinds of postures because we have our body, we know how to use it, and we can figure that out. On the other hand, we expect something different for common and rare dogs. Now remember, the rare dogs are dogs in human positions, and common postures are dogs in dog positions. The idea is if we can map our own experience onto dog postures, we should be able to co-opt our visual specialized processing onto dogs that are easily, dog postures that are easily mapped onto our own postures. So we did the same kind of inversion experiment where we showed people one stimulus, would go blank, and then we'd see a second one and you had to say whether or not the posture was the same or different. And what we find is we get this overall inversion effect for human bodies only, and this supports both the visual expertise and the embodiment hypothesis. Um, but here's the interesting thing. What we see is we get a three-way interaction. And what we, this interaction supports our um, body specificity hypothesis. And the idea is that we get strong inversion effects for common and rare human postures, but we only get an inversion effect for the rare dog postures. So this suggests that we are able to co-opt our specialized body processing to map onto things in the outside world that we can map onto, onto ourselves that are more or less like us. So, so we use our own body when there's a clear mapping between ourselves and someone else or something else in the world. Okay. So the idea is we can use our own body representations to interpret what other people are doing in the world if we can see the self-other mapping. So now we can show that we've had this sort of specialized body processing that it seems to be specific to bodies and the kinds of things that we can do with our bodies. But what we haven't done is we haven't shown that this kind of specialized processing mechanism is related to emotional processing. So this is what we're going to try to do next. So to try to get at this question, we did a study that was similar <coughs> to the first study that I showed you. Um, and we wanted to ask the question as to whether or not our specialized body processes alone affected our ability to perceive the, the postures of someone else, or whether these specialized body processes interacted with the emotional affect of, of other people's postures. Sort of like your affect, is it affecting your perception of someone else's affective posture? So to do this, we had sort of two kinds of conditions. We had a no posture condition in which you saw a visual image that went blank. You saw another one and you had to say whether it was same or different. And then we had a posture condition in which people were given instructions on how to get into a posture. They had to hold it and then go neutral and then decide whether this visual image was the same or different from what they were in previously. So, we had three different types of postures or categories of postures. We had positive affective postures, neutral postures, and negative affective postures. And I want to give you some example of post these postural instructions. I want you to follow along with me so you can get a sense of what this is like. So what I'd like you to do is put your right hand on your forehead, dip your head down and forward a little, and drop your shoulders. Is this a positive or a negative affective position? <laughs> So, something like hand right? Okay, let's try another one. Hold your arms in front of you, turn your palms up, and lean to the side. Positive or negative? Okay. Well, if you did it right, it sort of looks like a nurturing pose, right? So, I mean, this, those are examples of some instructions that we gave people. So, they would do this, then go front, uh, neutral, and figure out whether or not the patients were the same or different. So, the idea here is it if you're really only just doing you know self other mapping that's <coughs> independent of emotion you just get a difference for the you just find like a processing difference for things that match versus things that don't match but if, if the self other correspondence is actually influenced by the emotional valence of the stimuli, stimuli then what we would find is we get an interaction of the emotional uh, valence 
in, in the match. So here's an example of what we found. So we found that when people only viewed the stimuli, we found a little bit of effective match versus not match, but essentially we saw no difference across the emotional conditions. But something very different happened when people actually had to say, when they assumed a posture, and then had to say whether that posture was the same or different compared to someone else. What we found was that for the matching, for the matching postures, and this is proportion error, and the same thing works for response time as well, <coughs> we find that the emotional conditions, whether they're negative or positive, were slower and less accurate than the neutral postures, and there was no difference for the no match. So there's something going on when you were trying to figure out that whether or not you, what you're doing is the same as what someone else is doing. Now we thought, well, is this really a good test? Could it just be that emotional postures sort of have labels and they have some kind of semantic meaning to them, and that's all that we're really finding is that people are categorizing on a semantic level and that's just harder. So what we did is we created a set of stimuli in which we had neutral stimuli that also had specific kinds of labels like stop and salute and things that were sort of effectively neutral but were recognizable, labelizable, that's a good word, isn't it? Uh, easily labeled uh, postures. What we found, now here we, this is the second experiment, so here we have proportion error and here we have response time. But both of these graphs are showing us basically the same thing. We see a difference between the match and the non-match conditions. And what we find is that the affective <coughs> postures are processed differently from the neutral postures, whether they're meaningful or not. So what we're getting is we're getting interaction between sort of what we're doing with our bodies and the emotional affect of the stimuli. Okay. So what we can say is that the matched emotional posture effects can't be attributed to meaning. <coughs> the other thing we did was we also asked people how hard it was to get into these postures. Because one of the things you might say is that maybe it's harder to get into like negative postures or you know, sort of contorting yourself to get into these. But when we asked people to rate the difficulty of assuming any of the postures, not even just um, the emotional postures, they were all the same. There was no, no differences in, in subjective feelings of difficulty of, the, of maintaining or obtaining the postures. So this suggests that we have an interaction of these of sort of some specialized body processes with emotional <coughs> processing. So even for a task that really is a non-emotional task, all you're doing is saying whether you're the same as someone else, we're finding that the affect valent, effective valence of the stimulus is influencing our perception. Now you might say, well, why wasn't this a facilitation effect? You might have thought that we would get you know, better recognition for things that were the same as someone else. But I would like to say that I, you know, we thought long and hard about this. And the answer is there are a number of different sort of things that contribute to this. But part of it was the context of the task. We're asking whether or not someone is like you. You know, is it the same as you? But the idea is that you have a lot of very, lots of experience with your own body and some very finely defined categories of your own emotional experience. And so when you're putting yourself in this position, you may be just be simulating all, you know, bringing back all these, you know, simulations of previous emotional experiences. And that can't match just a visual stimulus of somebody else. And so that kind of thing is, is um, might account for some of these differences. The other thing is that there's some ecological validity for not always matching your affect with someone else. Anyone who has a child who's screaming and is throwing a tantrum knows that it doesn't do anybody any good to have a tantrum with your child. And if anyone's a clinician, everybody knows that you shouldn't, if you have a depressed patient, you don't want to match your effect with your patient's affect because that's not going to help anybody either. So they're actually, you know, so the idea of context is there are certain contexts where it's actually beneficial to you to not match someone else's emotion and not, and, and see discrepancies or differences between what you're feeling and someone else. So the idea here is we might be able to manipulate sort of what we're doing here to, to change the direction of the interaction. So that's some suggestion that maybe these specialized body processes uh, are involved in emotional processing. But you might also say, well, what happens when you look at a group of people who have impaired social processing, such as those individuals who have autism? So the first thing we did, uh, or basically, is we looked at body posture perception in autism. 
And a hallmark of autism is a lack of awareness and perception of other people's emotions in a social context. So we ask the question about whether or not this impaired social perception is associated with impaired body processing mechanisms. So we studied high-functioning adults with autism, and we examined whether or not they showed face, body posture, and house inversion effects. And what we found was that they showed no inversion effects for houses, either for the controls or autism. This is not significant, but it suggests that they're still doing something a little different from typical. Um, they, whoops, sorry. They did show a face inversion effect, and I'll get back to that in just a second. But the important thing here is that people with autism did not show an inversion effect, but people with the, the typically developing people did. Now, you might say, you know, why do they show face inversion effects if they have problems with social stimuli? Well, first of all, this is a this is sort of a, a, a variable finding in the autism literature. Some people with autism seem to be okay with face processing, and other people don't. Yeah, some show inversion effects, some don't. So there's variability across studies. But I think with this group, the reason why they're finding inversion effects is these are adults who were involved in social skills um, groups from the time that they were two years old, and they're now being tested in their 20s. And so for tw you know, essentially <coughs> 20 years, people are saying, look to the face, look to the face. What is the face doing? Tell me what the face is doing. Look at the cheeks, look at the eyes. So the idea is that these groups have been really trained hard to try to come up with rules for understanding what people's faces are telling them. So it's possible that they're getting inversion effects, but they're not the same, you know, but they're maybe from applying of rules or something that's slightly different from the controls. Or maybe it's just a select group of people. Um, the key here is that these therapy groups don't, get, don't say, look to the body, look to the body, and maybe they should. Because for people with autism, they have a hard time looking at people's faces and eyes. And if bodies are good indicators of emotion and intent and orientation, maybe therapists should be saying, look to the body. What's the body doing? Because that may be giving them information that's easier for them to process. Over time, they could develop better expertise in this. OK. Now, another way you can look at sort of the simulation or embodiment or sort of matching with other people is to look at rapid spatial uh, rapid facial responses, or what we call interpersonal matching. And the idea is that when we see other people, we often match their faces or match what they're doing to show that we're sort of uh, sharing emotions, sharing uh, social experience. But these interpersonal matching behaviors um, tend to be uh, atypical or absent in autism. Um, and so the question is, we've shown that this is true in adults, but the question is, what about kids? You know, because you know, maybe this is just something that develops later on. And so what we were able to show, or what we did was we actually looked to see whether children with autism engaged in these uh, rapid facial movements or matching behaviors. Uh, so what we, did is we looked at typical and autistic kids, and we had them passively view different kinds of emotional faces. And we put electrodes on their, on their faces to measure micro movements of their facial musculature. So for example, the zygomaticus, which is this, this one right here, is associated with a happy or a smile um, facial expression. Um, the corrugator is the one that's sort of right up here between the eyes, is associated with angry or a frown. And the frontalis has to do with fear or surprise with raised eyebrows. So we looked at typically developing kids and kids with autism. And what we found was when people were looking at happy faces, the typicals showed um, that the zygomaticus associated with the smile and the happy face separated out from the other muscles. Now these are kids, so they're a little bit slower than what the adults would be showing. Um, but however, when you see, look at the, the autistic group, you can see no differentiation among the muscles. This suggests that they're not doing this rapid matching of facial expression. When you look at angry faces, we also see a difference. In the kid, typically developing children, we see a dissociation of the frontalis response, which is sort of funny because when you see angry faces, the kids respond with fear, <laughs> um, which is, I guess, in retrospect, not so surprising. Um, however, the key thing to see is that you're not showing a rapid face response at all in autism. 
So in autism, we see a deficit in the sort of automatic engagement of these embodiment mechanisms. We see a lack of configuration and processing through the body postures. We find a lack of spontaneous mimicry during emotional perception. And some people have argued that what this may reflect, in addition to some, of, some other areas, is there may be some impairments of the neural substrates of embodiment. And some people have implicated the mirror neuron system and the systems as being part of this. Now, the mirror neuron systems are part of the, um, uh, are used to sort of match, you know, they get activated when you're doing something and you see someone else doing the same neurons are activated for the same kind of thing. So it's for self-other correspondences. And what people would argue is that these people with autism just can't spontaneously map their mental representations of their self to the representations of others. In other words, they can't understand the meanings of other people's actions. And if they can't do that, then we suggest that this may generally impair their ability to do these embodied simulations that we, that we consider sort of like the basis of social understanding and emotional processing. So, in conclusion, we believe that humans have perceptual systems that are optimized for processing life key information. We have specialized perceptual processes to integrate information from ourselves with other people. And we think that the social psychologists who are emphasizing these embodied emotion theories need to actually include these kinds of specialized uh, body processing mechanisms as the front end of their theory that helps set up the whole simulation of uh, emotional simulation process. And we think that, you know, another piece of evidence for why they, they should probably do this is that when you look at people who potentially have uh, social disorders, these mechanisms seem to be impaired. And what I'd like to do is acknowledge my colleagues. This is Danny McIntosh at the University of Denver. Susan Hepburn helped us with our autistic subjects. Valerie Stone, some of you may be aware of Valerie Stone's work. She was my colleague at University of Denver, who was at University of Queensland, and I'm not sure where she is right now. Um, Jim Tanaka, <coughs> Sarah, and a variety of postdocs and graduates and undergraduates. So, thank you very much.